How do you rig sit underwater? What can fish actually see? How do you cast and bait accurately? And what do you need to catch consistently? Cracking dog scaly mirror. Absolutely stunning. I've been a carp angler for over 30 years and a diver for nearly 20. I spend a massive amount of my time underwater studying carp and carp fishing. I've seen the best and the worst. I've swum with them, watched them feed and studied their behaviour and characteristics. In total I've got hundreds of hours of knowledge and some incredible underwater footage that I'm more than happy to share with you. Welcome to Understanding Underwater. Well, here we are back out on the bank again and summer is turning to winter. Just look at the leaves behind me. They're turning golden brown and soon they'll be on the floor and in the lake and everything will be cold. And that is the subject of understanding underwater this month. We're going to be looking at what to do through the course of the winter. How can you maximise your chances? What are the little things that make a big difference in the colder months in comparison with the summer months? We know the carp aren't as active. We know the carp can't feed. That is common knowledge. But today is all about giving you extra edges to make sure that you guys catch fish through the winter. Now we've had some brilliant feedback over the course of the last few months with this series and we've invited you to send in your questions and we're going to kick off with one today that's very very relevant to the forthcoming months. It's all about indication, how your line lays and what happens below the surface to maximise your chance of getting a bite. Hi Rob, my question is could you do an underwater video doing a comparison between fixed legs running leads and how they compare to how much indication you get back at the rods. Nice one John, that's a brilliant question. Now what we'll do is we'll put that to the test but we're going to do three rather than just two straightforwards. We're going to do a bog standard lead clip which a lot of anglers use. We'll do the running rig but we'll also do a heli as well because it's a sort of little bit of an in-betweener and we'd like to see that too. So we've got three rigs made up, we'll bang them out into the pond, set them up as if we're fishing and then I'll get out into the water and I will be the carp. I'll pick it up and move them in exactly the same way and we'll see what sort of indication we get on the bank here. Now obviously I can't do that on my own, so I'm going to get Steve, our able cameraman. He's going to be on the bank and he's going to be talking to you about what's happening here while I'm showing you what's happening out there. Well, I've just put the first rod out and it's the running rig we're going to start off with done everything I normally would in a fishing situation. Rob's gone out there now in a dive kit. He's going to have a little bit of move around with the lead and he's going to keep doing that until I get the indication this end and I'll strike the rod. That's when we'll be able to compare and see how much indication we get between all three different setups and which is the best for indication. So let's get below the surface and have a look at the first one. And the first thing you'll notice now is how clear the water is. You can see the water is quite pale in colour as well and whilst there's a bit of green around it's not as green as it usually is. Here's the first thing to look at too, there is the line and you can just see there that a light line does blend in quite well with the surroundings. There's not as much bright light around. And here we are down on the spot, there's a bit of weed out there and we're using pop-ups just to make it easier for me to be able to find that rig so I'm just pulling back there. You can see Steve in the inset picture there, it's just got a little bit of indication. 
and he struck it and out of my hand it goes so that was reasonably good didn't move too far cast two going in now he's going to hit the clip feel it down on a tight line and set it in a very very similar way to the last one and there it is down on the deck looking from a different angle now you can see the camera's fixed and it's looking away from the light rather than to it and you can see the water color is actually quite a bit darker so just picking it up again moving away this is the heli and that's moved a similar sort of distance there getting a bit of indication just a couple of bleeps and steve's on it like a shot and that was a similar amount to the last one third one in now down on the clip a softer landing on that And here it is, you can see I'm just swimming up to it now, bait down on the bottom now and just have a look at the colour of the water again there. This is the third shot now and you can see there's a lot of what we call scatter in the water, there's a lot of dying algae and that's me kicking up a bit of stuff. So reaching down and grabbing the rig, you can see it's on a tight line clip system just picking it up moving it away indication straight away struck it and I feel it pull out at not far off the same again well that was pretty interesting and what I've got to say is actually there wasn't really that much difference between the three different rigs on a tight line you know whichever one we looked at whether it was the heli the clip or alternatively the running it was more or less the same because they're all fished on a similar sort of line a lot of the time it was thick end of a meter I would say 80 centimetres to a metre, which is a little bit further than I would normally expect. I remember when I used to do these tests a lot of the time with the magazines, it would be fingertip to elbow would be like the standard, and this was a little bit further. Now, travelling back along the lines and having a look, I can see why that was the case, because there was a little hedge, a small clump of weed in between the rod here and the lead out there. And what's happening is you've got a little bit of an angle in the line, which is why it's really important to know what's between you and your lead, because that can have a massive effect on your indication. Well, there it is. I've got to say, there isn't an awful lot to be seen between them, whether you're fishing a fixed or a running lead. If you're on a tight line, I think on a slack line, it might be a little bit different, particularly with a running, but on a tight line, it doesn't make the slightest bit of difference. Uh, and the same with the heli as well. It was more or less the same whatever it was so actually that's not the big issue so by order of the peaky blinders you can use whatever you want right a subject that's really really interesting is individual bleeps when you get one is it a liner or have you got done what's the score now you may have seen some footage that i've put up in the past of when i can lift the rig up and move it around You'd be quite surprised actually how much I can move out there. So the big question now, particularly in the winter, is when you get a single bleep, should you strike it or shouldn't you? So what I want to do is put liners to the test. So I'm fishing my standard setup here. You'll see that I've got medium sensitivity on the alarms. I've got medium hang on the bobbins and I've got medium weight bobbins on. So the test that we're going to do now is I'm going to go out into the water and I'm basically on this setup, I'm going to twang it close in, mid-range and also at the, uh, the lead end, down at the bottom end, and see what sort of indication we get here. And then with a the tight line, you know more or less that if you've got a bleep, something's moved the lead. With a slack line, it could be anywhere. That's what I think the conclusion will be. But without further ado, I'm going to get in and let's put that to the test. Liners, where do they happen and how? Right, so here I am in the water just around about the rod tips and keep your eye if you can do on the inset picture as well as the main one. So I'll just flick the line, a little bit of movement there and you can see it's close to the rod tip so as a result you get that indication straight away on that bobbin. But interestingly it's more when you pull it sideways than when you lift it up and down that you get that indication. So anything moving up and down doesn't do that much. Going a bit further out now you see the lines are dirty, they've been in the water for a good 12-18 hours so they're nice and settled in. And there was just a little bit of a pull as I moved that then. And you can see that was the only thing that gave that bobbin a twitch. 
a little bit further out now, probably three quarters of the way out, and this is going to cause us a big issue because this is weed in the way that will have a massive effect on the indication that we get back at the rod end. I'm just pulling the line off that weed. Single bleep there. And you can see when I reach over onto the other side, what I class the far side of the weed, we don't get any indication at all. So I can lift that line up and move it around there. Whereas when I'm lifting it off the weed, that does make a bit of a difference. Looking now, there's a really nice little clear spot. Showing you this just to show that that's a typical spot that a fish may have fed on fairly recently. The line is down there somewhere, but it's very, very hard to see when it's down in the weed. Very well camouflaged. And this is my baited spot. You can see I've got a reasonable amount of corn, some worm. And I've just got my hand on the lead core there. And watch that bobbin. I'm lifting it up, moving it a little bit, and there's absolutely no indication at all there. And that's purely because of that weed bed is in the way, stopping the indication going backwards. So once again there, we're seeing that it's absolutely vital that you need to keep a straight line to your rigs. Make sure you know if there's any weed in the way. And if there is any weed around, if you get a single bleep, just hit it just in case. What does that lead us on to? It now leads us on to indication and tight versus slack lines, because this is something that I'm always asked. And I've got a little bit of a hobby horse about this as well. So we're gonna get a tight line and a slack line bang out against each other. Steve's going to help me out with this one and we're going to see what the difference is between those two. We should be having the camera rolling now. Actually. It is rolling. Oh, is it? <laughs> Have we got audio on? Yeah. Right then, mate. So this is where Stevie boy has <laughs> got to get them absolutely perfect so we can go, or I can go in and test it. Six foot's not good enough for today's world. No. Two foot. Mine would use two foot. Well, that's unpopular. <laughs> Is it? Leave it on there then. If it's on top, that's brilliant. He reckons it's on top, we'll test it. Right then, let's go and have a look and see exactly how close Steve was and we're down below the surface now. And you can see once again visibility is pretty decent and there is that big clump of weed that i was talking about earlier you can just see the line going through it i'm just pointing to it there and that is the right hander the left hander which is the slack line is going just to the left hand side of that whereas the right hander is bending around it so we'll have to see whether or not that has any effect on the indication a bit later on it's always nice to have a bit of a swim around ponds. You can see what the weed's like. You can see a really nice little stony clear area there just on the back of that weed bed. That'd be brilliant if you could find it. Obviously quite difficult to present to though. And then we're getting a little bit closer to the drop zone now. And there's a really, really nice sandy area there, look. And that is the right hand line. The left hand line is there. They look like they're very, very close. Remember that one that we're looking at on the left hand side is the slack line the tight line is the one on the right and we're just pulling up now very very close and just look at that this is genuine folks that is where steve cast his rigs out to and they are very very close together literally dartboard close almost bit of a risky area to present a bait you need a long link there and we're using pop-ups just so we can find them and i'm coming in now you can see in the inset the left hand is the slack which is the one in my right hand so we're just moving away with both of them together big bleeps on one oh and it's the slack line one that is a surprise much more indication on that slack line but i hadn't moved it far as if i was bolting off that's a big difference i've got to say that that's really confused me a little bit because of all the tests and i've been doing this an awful lot of the time i found that tight line tends to be better than slack line at indication at long range and Steve reporting back that that first one on the slack was a little bit better than the other one. You know, the movement was absolutely clean to be seen. It really confused me. So I thought, let's repeat the exercise now, but let that run develop. Because the bobbin had twitched a little bit, the other one hadn't moved at all. The slack line certainly picked up the early indication, but let's have a look at what happens when it develops into a full-blooded proper run. Right then, here we go again. Bait's nice and close together. 
slack line will be in my right hand, tight on the left. But look at the inset now. It's the rod on the middle rest that's slack. The one on the right is the tight. And really keep an eye on those bobbins, look. The middle one is starting to lift, but the right-hander is moving as well. That's starting to peel forward. So actually, there's not a lot between the two of them there on a full-blooded run. You know what, when you look at the two of them now, it makes a little bit more sense. But after that first one, it really blew my mind in particularly because like I say, I've done this so many times before and I couldn't work out what it was. And I was thinking, is it stretch of line? Is it line lay? Is it gonna be where it's going over the top of the weed? Because this is definitely something to think about. If your rod is here and your lead is ending up there and there's a hedge of weed in between, a slack line, you can basically pull it over the top. Imagine if you throw rope over the top of a hedge, you could pull it across. Whereas if it's tight, you'll tighten it down, it'll squash it in it and tension will be held by the hedge. So I thought it might be something to do with line tension. The long and short of it, having looked back, is that I personally think that where you're fishing slack line, you get a lot more indication, but it's not necessarily always a run. So sometimes it can be a bit confusing. Obviously, if the bobbin goes to the top and then moves, then clearly it's a bite. But if it just goes up and potentially back down, we've seen with line bites and how much line I can move underneath the water on a slack line, that actually it's not always a bite. And there's gonna be people out there watching this going, well, I already know that. I get that. But this isn't just about learning new things, it's reinforcing what you already know. And that's a perfect practical example of if you're tight line fishing, you know what, when it goes, it's a bite. Simple as. So if you don't want line bites, if you're not fishing for anything indication wise, other than just a full blooded run, then tighten your lines up and fish bowstring tight. If you want to know what's going out there and you want a little bit more indication, then slacken them off. And that's the biggest thing I think that we can take for this because coming into winter, if you fish bowstring tight, then you're not gonna know anything about what's passing in between you and your lead. Yes, when you get a bite, you're gonna get a bite, but it's not telling you anything more. And for me personally, I like to fish slacker in the winter just because it lets me know if this fish moving around a little bit and a slack line allows that. I tell you what, I have been a busy bunny for you. I've been in and out of the water, testing rigs, back and to, up and down all the time. And I've got one more last thing before I disappear and go and do a little bit of angling for myself. And that's to bust a couple of myths. Maggots. Now we're coming into maggot time of year. Everybody loves a maggot, a worm, a caster, whatever. Let's pile it in, let's shove as many in as possible because it's brilliant and we're automatically gonna catch loads of fish. Not necessarily the case. Let's look at maggots first and foremost. I've got a personal opinion about maggots and I don't think that they should go in in the quantity that some people put them in. I really don't think that you need that many for a number of reasons. Firstly, the little bags of ammonia and if you put too much in and they're not eaten, then when they break down, they can poison the bottom of the lake. And as a result, that affects what grows in it and it stops the fish feeding it in the future. So gallons and gallons of maggots in my mind, absolute no go. Small amounts of maggots, yes. And that leads us to the question of reds or whites, which is best? Personal preference, white stands out a little bit more. Red, you know, I, I quite like red as well because that does stand out, but it's a little bit more subtle, especially if you've got a big bed of them. Mix of the two, you know what, that works as well. Do maggots bury themselves underwater? Shut up, bird. Do maggots bury themselves in the silt? once they've gone in? That's a question I get asked a lot of the time. And the answer is absolutely not. You know, there's this harebrained idea that actually they'll burrow in the silt or they'll all crawl off. Guess what? Maggots need air to breathe. There isn't any air underwater. They will crawl out from a PVA bag to a little bit bigger than a dinner plate, not quite as big as a bin lid, a little bit bigger than a dinner plate, and then they run out of steam and basically snuff it. They don't burrow themselves in and actually neither do worms either. So they all sit on the surface, they spread out a little bit, they'll go down on a spod drop, and remember a spod drop in about 10 foot of water will go to about this or this. They'll crawl a little bit further. So from a spod, you might get a bin lid and a light scattering. Alternatively, from a PVA bag, you might get a dinner plate. That is as far as they go. Well, that's it. 
It's now time for a bit of angling. It's getting just that little bit too cold to put me back in the water for the rest of the winter. But we hope you've enjoyed underwater answers through the course of the first season. Loads and loads and loads of questions are coming, loads answered. But don't forget, there will be more coming next year. And in the meantime, if you've got any questions, fire them in. Follow us on social media, on Facebook, and of course, on YouTube. There'll be plenty of information going out there from some of the things that we've already looked at that we haven't put out yet. Have a brilliant winter. Hope you've learned stuff, and we'll see you next year.